Good morning. Oh, let's try that again. Good morning. Good morning. Morning, Danny. Hey, that was really great, even with the masks on. Great job. We are so glad to be here and worship with you today. Um, It's a beautiful day, and if we get more rain, that's a great thing, right? Because we need the rain. Um, We are here to worship, to praise our Holy Father, Jesus Christ, his Son, who gave his life to save us. And we have made a choice to follow him. So we're going to start this morning with, I will follow.
Good morning. Where is that voice coming from? How's everybody today? Doing good? Doing okay? Is anybody here? I see people. I don't hear people. I'm praying, I heard. Oh, okay. Good. Well, don't let me interrupt your praying. Uh, today we are in our second week of um, our series about John Wesley. Um, and the reason we're doing this series is to introduce us a little bit more to who John Wesley was and what his influence, influence there we go, what his influence was uh, in his time period and how he continues to be a motivating force in our lives as we uh, uh, in, in strive to follow um, Christ through the United Methodist Way or through the Wesleyan Way, and um, so what we're we're doing is is we're using the, a study by Adam Hamilton called Revival. And um, if you'd like to get a little bit deeper into what we're doing on Sunday mornings, we're having a Bible study on Zoom on Thursday evenings at 6:30. If you'd like to tune into that, uh, we're talking about uh, the scripture leading into the the Sunday morning so this last 
uh, Thursday night, we talked about what we're talking about this morning. Um, so if you would like to, to have a little preview of what's going on Sunday morning and like to, to get a little bit deeper into what the, um, the John Wesley's life and theology and in important, importance was in, uh, in our uh, history as United Methodist, I invite you to do that. You can call the church office and sign up or enroll and we'll get, make sure you get a, a Zoom notification and uh, can participate that way. Um, also, um, want to let you know that if you are um, here this morning, you registered at the station registration the uh, registration station. Say that five times fast, right? And uh, you were able to pick up some gloves and masks if you didn't have them, and and uh, give your your tithe, your offering, uh, whatever uh, this morning. So um, you've had that opportunity. And uh, for those of you who are watching online. Uh, whether live or later today or later in the week. Um, welcome to you as well. And uh, you also have the opportunity to, uh, to give on, online or by texting. Uh, there's uh, information there on, the, on our website on how to do that. So please go there. And uh, if you would like to contribute, uh, you can do that there as well. Um, another thing, too, is, is we get everybody here registered in names and know who they are. Um, so if you who are online, if you would like to uh, just comment um, when you're watching this, just comment something, hi, um, whatever, you know, I, I, I like that song, I, I, I uh, liked what the pastor had to say, I didn't like, no, don't say you didn't like what I had to say, just, just stick with the way you like kind of stuff, uh, keep it positive and, uh, and fun, and, um, and let us know where you're at so we can have an idea of, of where we're uh, where we're reaching people. We know we're reaching people in, in various locations throughout not only Indiana, but uh, other places in the country as well. So thank you uh, for everybody for being present today. So this story or this uh, study of John Wesley is called revival. And uh, revival can be a scary word because when we think of revival, we think of people yelling and dancing in the aisles and speaking in tongues and running around and altar calls and all of this kind of stuff, but really revival very simply has to do with being reinvigorated or being restored or to become strong and healthy after a, a period of, of decline. And who of us uh, who have gone through 2020 up to this point doesn't need a little reinvigorating, a little revival, a little restoration, a little more renewal in our lives? And for John Wesley, this, this idea of being renewed and being revived had to do with being fully in love with God. And the scripture we're going to take a look at this morning uh, is a passage in 1 Peter, and uh, it's chapter 1, verses 13 through 16, and it says this, Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Discipline yourselves. Set all your hope on the grace that Jesus Christ will bring you when he is revealed. Like obedient children, do not be conformed to the desires that you formerly had in ignorance. Instead, as he who called you is holy, be holy yourselves in all your conduct. For it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. That's a tough concept for us to get our minds around, isn't it? I mean, we don't want to come across as holier than thou to other people. We all know people who we thought to ourselves, that, that person's just holier than thou. And we know what we mean by that, right? Somebody that's, that thinks they're better than somebody else. Thinks are uh, other people. The, the idea that uh, of, of a bit of a self-righteousness. But when Peter is, is writing about um, being holy. It's not a, a self-righteousness. It's not a righteousness that's, that's brought on by yourself. And, and John Wesley goes on to, to um, interpret and to explain what it means to, to be considered holy and how to reach this, this state of holiness that we all long for. So we'll find out more about that as, as the service goes on. But for right now, we're going to have a time of prayer together. And during our prayer together this morning, at the end of the prayer, I'm going to leave a little moment of silence for you to uh, uh, pray 
um, yourselves and to name those uh, whom you would like to pray for uh, during our time of prayer this morning. So let us pray. O oh Lord, we long to live a holy life worthy of our calling as Christ's own. Guide us this day and every day as we seek to revive our lives that we may more fully live to your glory. Not just our lives as individual followers of Jesus, but also our life and community together. Help us to know that holiness is a gift from you that brings glory to you. It is not something that we attain on our own strength or power to bring glory to ourselves. Help us to follow in the footsteps of Jesus that we may be his. Restore us. Heal our brokenness in whatever form it appears in our lives and in the lives of our loved ones, particularly those whom we silently name before you now. all God's people said, Amen.
last week we talked about one of the things in John's life when he was five, he was uh, uh, spared his life by being uh, saved from the fire that was set to the parsonage that uh, his father uh, that belonged to the church that his father was, was serving at the time as pastor. And um, we're going to fast forward to uh, about 10 or so this morning um, when John went to a, a, a house called Charterhouse School in London. Uh, it was a, a private school. It was a boarding school. And uh, he went away there, and he excelled as a student. Um, he did very well there. He attended there because of a scholarship that his father, Samuel, was able to um, uh, receive because of uh, being a priest in the Church of England. He didn't have a whole lot of money, and he wouldn't have been able to otherwise afford a um, good uh, private education for his son. So he was able to go to this school on, um, on um, um, scholarship, and uh, John would later write in his, uh, uh, in, in life, he would write that um, in, in s the next six or seven years, so he was 10 when he went there, so from the time he was 10 to about 16 or 17, the next six or seven years were spent at school were outward restraints being removed, I was much more negligent than before even of outward duties and almost continually guilty of outward sins, which I knew to be such, though they were not scandalous in the eyes of the world. Simple translation of that is, I went away to school in my teen years, and guess what? I messed around and did things I wasn't supposed to, like all teens do. And I knew they were wrong, but I did them anyway, because that's what teens do. This teen's just a normal kid, normal pre uh, preacher's kid. Goes on to say, however, even though he was doing these things, committing these sins, as he called them, However, I still read the scriptures and said my prayers morning and evening. And what I now hoped to be saved by was, one, not being so bad as other people. Two, having still a kindness for religion. And three, reading the Bible, going to church, and saying my prayers. In other words, he, he put his hope of salvation into doing outward acts. Not that they were bad things, but they were things he kept doing. But there were other things he was not doing because of not being at home with mom and dad. So what he did is he, he was able to keep up with with the bare minimum, right? And hoped that that was enough to save him. Been there, done that. Anybody else? Kind of get into this idea of, of thinking that there's, you know, I, I, I'm not as bad as other people. I mean, I don't, I haven't done any of the, I haven't broken any of the Ten Commandments. Well, not that often anyway. Or not that anybody would notice. Well, I was never caught, so it never really happened. And we think that if, if we're not as bad as the other guy, that that's okay. That that's what it takes, and, and that's what saves us. I mean, we've, we've all been there. Having a kindness for religion. He talked about that he thought that would, would be the thing that would save him. And obviously we are all here this morning because we have a kindness for religion. Or we wouldn't be here. 
And he put his hope in, in those two things, but then he, he added a third, reading the Bible, going to church, and saying my prayers. He put his hope in those things, hoping that he would find fulfillment and meaning and, and purpose of life. But over the years, John Wesley found out that there's more to it than that. That that's not all there is to life. That that's not all God wants from us. That's not all that he wanted for himself. For he had this, this longing for holiness. And these things were not making him holy, he thought. That there must be something more. Well, shortly after he eventually completed his, his bachelor's degree, he began working on his master's and his ordination. And during this time, he was introduced to a book during his studies by Jeremy Taylor entitled The Rule and Exchange of Holy Living. And one of the themes of the book that spoke to John uh, particularly was the Apostle Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 10, 31 that says, So whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do everything for the glory of God. Whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do for the glory of God. In other words, everything that you do should be an act of worship. Not just coming to church on Sundays, not, not just reading the Bible, not just prayer, but everything that we do should be something that we do to bring glory and honor to God, whether it's, it's eating or drinking. And, and that doesn't just mean that we, we say a prayer before our meal. means that we find that there's more to life than just eating and drinking. That we are able to eat and drink because of, of God's care for us and provision for us. Now, some of you are thinking, well, I was the one that went to Kroger's. I was the one that went to Applebee's and paid my bill. What did God have to do with that? Good question, isn't it? You ever stop and think that, that God put the people that work at Kroger's and Applebee's and McDonald's and all the other places that we go to get food, that God has allowed them to have employment to care for their needs while they're caring for yours. And that God is, is working behind the scenes with everything that's going on in our lives, whether we know it or not, whether we acknowledge it or not. I listen to uh, meditation tapes at night, or not tapes. I keep calling them tapes, but they're not tapes. It's an app on my phone. And one of them is a, a meditation that's uh, the art of gratitude. And I won't say the whole thing for you, but it starts out by saying, you know, as you're laying there in your bed, be grateful for your bed. Grateful for my bed? Why would I be grateful for my bed? Well, if I didn't have that, I'd be sleeping on the floor. Okay, so I'm grateful for my bed. And, and not only your bed, but think about the people who made that bed. The people whose lives are sustained. And that how you're purchasing that bed helps pay for them to be employed and to care for their family. You see the, 
America, how we are all connected in that kind of way. It kind of, kind of puts a different perspective, for me anyway, in the way that we see life. And so that whenever I, I do anything, I can, I can imagine that what went into it, who's behind it, and I can give thanks. Not just for some unknown person, but for the God who placed that unknown person in a position to bless me. So whether I eat or drink or whatever you do, do everything for the glory of God. Another passage of the book that spoke to John Wesley was the doxology found in the Lord's Prayer. You know how the end goes, right? Let me get caught up because I know you're all starting to prayer at the beginning now. To think how it's going to go or how it's going to end, right? Anybody else do that kind of thing? I do that all the time. They ask me for the last four digits of my social security number. I have to do the whole thing. I can't just give them the last four, right? Okay, so are you caught up with the Lord's Prayer now? The end is, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, right? Well, Wesley saw that he and others were being led astray to rewording the doxology to a prayer that was much different than his own. And he saw that those were the words that he was praying, but the life that he was living resembled more of this. For mine is the kingdom and the power and the glory sense of doing things for himself, for his own power, for his own glory. And so when John read those words and, and meditated on those words, he, he instantly resolved to dedicate his life to God, all my thoughts, he said, all my words and all my actions. And this was when he was 23 years old. What were you doing when you were 23? Starting your first job out of college? Working at the same job you'd had since graduation? Starting a family? Worrying about where you were going to live, how you were going to pay the bills? Not John. At 23, he dedicated his life to God, and dedicated himself to turn the world upside down. And eventually, John wrote a sermon based on these convictions and other sermons where he begged his audience to not be satisfied with being an almost Christian, as he called it, but encouraged them to become an altogether Christian. Through a series of questions, he laid out what it means to be an altogether Christian. And I'm going to try to read these as John would have preached them as a very rapid fire questions with, with passion and, 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 and to not give you a chance to respond, but to, to feel what it feels like to be in the presence of somebody who is passionate about this idea of uh, being an all-together Christian. This is what he said while preaching. Is the love of God shed abroad in your heart? Can you cry out, my God and my all? Do you desire nothing but him? Are you happy in God? Is he your glory, your delight, your crown of rejoicing? And is this commandment written in your heart that he who loveth God love his brother also? Do you then love your neighbor as yourself? Do you love every man, even your enemies, even the enemies of God, as your own soul, as Christ loved you? Yea, dost thou not believe that Christ loved thee? 
and gave himself for thee? Hast thou faith in his blood? Believeth thou the Lamb of God that taketh away thy sins and cast them as a stone to the depth of the sea, that he hath blotted out the handwriting that was against thee, taking it out of the way, nailing it to his cross? Hast thou indeed redemption through his blood, even the remission of thy sins? And doth his spirit bear witness with thy spirit that thou art a child of God? All together Christian is one who seeks to love God with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength, and their neighbor as themselves. See, for John, holiness wasn't about gaining knowledge. It's very important. Education is important. Knowledge is important. Acquiring information is important, but it was also just as important to be involved in acts of mercy for the less fortunate and the underprivileged. So for John, holiness was uniting the head and the heart, which makes sense, since Jesus taught us, remember, that we are to love God with our heart, mind, soul, and strength, our, our heart and our mind our soul and our strength, all that we are. And so John began surrounding himself with other like-minded believers. He was able to find other people who had this longing for holiness, this desire to have more in their lives than just going through the motions and doing what you're supposed to do. And so this group met at Christian University. And at this university, they were made fun of. Can you imagine being in a Christian setting and wanting to know God more, longing to have that holiness that, that God wants us to have? and being ridiculed by your classmates or in church being ridiculed by the person in the pew next to you because you want something more in your relationship to God they were made fun of and they were called they were called bible moths because they spent so much time in the Bible. They were called Holy Club because they thought they were, they were perceived as thinking they were holier than everybody else because they gathered together. And actually, this group of people were first called Methodists as a derogatory term because of their intentional and methodical approach to pursuing holiness. They met for prayer. They met for Bible study, and they met for fellowship. And their meetings kind of resembled what is described in the book of Acts, chapter 2, where the disciples met together daily. So these members of the Holy Club, these Bible moths, these Methodists met together regularly to encourage one another on in their, their quest for holiness. And more than that, they took that intellectual part of it, and as they read the scriptures and came to understand the scriptures, they started doing what the scriptures said. in an attempt to fulfill the, the parable of the sheep and the goats. You know that parable, right? The sheep are on one side and the goats are on another side when Christ comes into his glory and the ones on the right are the, the sheep who have followed his way and 
The ones on his left are the goats who have not. Both groups pose to Jesus the question after Jesus says, I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. You know the passage, right? Those on the right, Jesus said that as often as you fed somebody, you fed me. As often as you clothed somebody, you clothed me. Likewise, he said to this side, it, w when you didn't come and visit me, when I was sick and in prison, you, when you didn't come and visit others when you're sick and prison, you didn't come and visit me. When you weren't feeding other people and taking care of the needs of others, you, you were doing that to me. You, you weren't doing that to me. And so this holy club began not just meeting for intellectual purposes, but they began calling on the elderly in their village. They began caring for the poor in their town. They began working with low-income children. Even going so far as to pooling their resources to, to hire a teacher that could teach the children who otherwise would have no education. Other ways John pursued the quest for holiness was rising at 4 or 5 in the morning for private prayer, fasting two days a week till mid-afternoon, meeting with others to study the Bible as well as other Christian writings and to hold one, accountable, one another accountable in faith. Wesley and his friends continued attending public worship and received the Eucharist or communion day or weekly. Daily they read and meditated on scripture and together they sought to achieve lives of simplicity. We'll find out more about that later on as the study unfolds. But John and the others knew that it wasn't just enough to do these things, that they also needed to invite the Holy Spirit to change them through their endeavors. Not to just go through the motions, but to continue going through the motions so that the Holy Spirit might change them. They believed that all of humanity, themselves included, were marred by sin and were in need of, of restoration. We look around our world today, we know that our world is in need of restoration. Our country is in need of restoration. Our churches are in need of restoration. And for John Wesley, that all starts with individuals being restored. See, their hope was to be restored by the Spirit and made into what God intended them to be, which, which, which would be to be a human being who wholly loves God and wholly loves their neighbors themselves. You know, I say that a lot, but that's really what it boils down to, isn't it? But we need to keep being reminded of that over and over again. Because the ways of the world are so enticing. When we think of revival, as I said at the beginning, we think of loud services and altar calls and, and running up and down the aisles and all these kind of things. But when we think of restoration, what do we think of? Old cars, right? That's what you do with an old car is you restore it. And with that in mind, I'd like to read to you from 
the book, Revival by Adam Hamilton. And this is called, We're All Junkers. One metaphor I've found useful in describing God's work in the life of Christians is that of restoring old cars. I once preached an entire sermon series using this metaphor. I found a 1966 Mustang convertible in terrible condition, sitting at an area junkyard. We bought the junker, and I had it towed to the church, where we pushed it into the chancel of our sanctuary for the four weeks of the sermon series. How's it like that? A church member had a beautifully restored Mustang that we also had brought into the chancel. We have a large chancel. We interviewed people who restore old Mustangs, inviting them to describe the process of restoration. Then we used their words and these two cars to illustrate spiritual restoration. I remember interviewing the guys who ran the Mustang junkyard in Kansas City. I asked one of them, what do you see when you look at these dilapidated Mustangs in your salvage yard? He said, I don't see them as they are. I see what they could be. What a powerful picture of how God views us. The church is God's salvage yard. And he sees what we could be. Our task is to invite him to restore us. As we do, little by little, he strips us down to the bare metal and then begins perfectly restoring us. If we're willing to pursue the Christian life, if we're willing to say, take me, Lord, my heart, my life, my all, and make me what you want me to be, then God, through the Spirit, will restore us. As the sermon series ended, I discussed the, the three types of restored cars. Some are called trailer queens because they are moved from show to show on trailers and never driven. Others are Sunday-only cars, driven just on the occasional Sunday when the weather is fair. But to me, the best restoration projects are the daily drivers, driven regularly, often daily. I noted that those calling themselves Christians can be found in each of these categories as well. I ended the final sermon and service, the final sermon and worship service by getting into the restored Mustang and driving away, encouraging our members to be daily drivers and to take their faith to the streets. So when you consider yourself this morning. Where are you in the restoration process? Amen. As the praise team's coming up to go to, why don't we stand up? You've been sitting a long time. Let me stand up for a little bit. And don't sing because you're not supposed to. But you can clap. You can tap your toe. You can do other. You can raise your hand. You can do whatever you want. Now, I know we just talked about revivals being scary and being like <laughs> that. But if the spirit moves you, just dance around. Dance around.
I go this day and every day as a daily driver, taking your faith into the streets. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.